community and, and how that is all shifting in an era of fragmentation, both from a distribution perspective, but also in terms of the way that sport is being consumed. Um, if you haven't heard of Walk, we are the global authority on marketing effectiveness, but I've got a type 15, so I'm not going to spend too long on that one. Right. Um, the, today's presentation is based on a report that we launched uh, about six weeks ago. Um, there's a lot in there. What I'm trying to try and do for you is distill everything into three key points. The first, and to state that the blindingly obvious live sport still really matters, still has cultural impact. Um, but that impact is evolving as consumption changes um, and, and fragments. And this, we think, is driving a, a new kind of sports media economy um, that's changing the way that brands, media owners and rights holders um, interact with, with, with their end, you know, the end consumer, the fan. Um, but before we get into some of the sort of challenges facing the industry, um, let's be absolutely clear. Live sports still packs a huge punch. It still has significant cultural impact. And it, it crucially, it delivers live mass concurrent audiences in a way that literally nothing else does out there. No other content format can bring people together to watch something at the same time um, in the way that live sport does, particularly those big set piece events. And, and nothing says that quite like um, the Super Bowl. We just recently had it, well, six weeks ago or two months ago or so. Um, that big number there, 123.4 million was the live viewing audience for the, for the Super Bowl 58, um, Kansas City Chiefs beating the San Francisco 49ers. It was the largest concurrent big, you know, single viewing audience that we've seen in the US ever, which is, which is ridiculous in an era of fragmentation. Um, it was up 7% year on year, which may have been the Taylor Swift effect. Um, but, but actually, it continues a trend that we've been seeing over the last few years in that particular sport. And this is true in Europe as well. Big finals, um, you know, when the England football team does well, we are seeing the kind of audiences that we haven't seen in 30 or 40 years in other genres. And why is that? I mean, it's an interesting question to dwell on. As we fragment into our own niches, our own communities, our own sort of fan groups, why do we all come together for these? Well, we spoke to Silvia Cristiana Marinescu at OMD EMEA for the report, and her suggestion is that actually as the world is becoming more polarised and we are all being fragmented into our own groups, there is still something really powerful about those big common mass culture experiences. And 2024 is going to be a huge year for sport. You're going to hear it lots today. Um, we've got big men's uh, international football competitions culminating with the Euros in Germany. Um, there's all the sort of big usual finals, T20, Cricket, World Cup, and the big one is the return of the Olympic Games to Europe. Unbelievably, 12 years um, since London, which makes me feel terribly old. Um, and I think the big point as well for the Olympic Games is this is the first time in eight years that we have, the Games hasn't been in Asia, if we're talking about winter and summer. So for a US audience, this is the first Games in a, in a US-friendly time zone. So it's going to be a big litmus test for the strength of, of the Olympic movement um, and, and whether it's able to, to sort of drive those, those big audiences. But either way, huge opportunities for brands and advertisers, you would think. Media owners and rights holders certainly think so. We're, we're seeing investment in sports media rights going up and up from that sort of bottoming out in the middle of the pandemic, um, which was, you know, uh, totally expected. And it's forecast to keep going. But there's a but, of course there's a but, otherwise I wouldn't be on stage. Um, brands who are trying to use sport as a way of driving mass reach to deliver their campaign goals are coming up against a challenge, which is that the way that that live sport is being consumed is fragmenting. And that's partially to do with the way that rights are being distributed um, between broadcasters um, and streaming platforms and mobile apps. It's also to do with the way that consumers now are consuming, engaging with media and the devices that they use. So let's take a few of those different drivers one by one. Now, one of the big ones is subscription video on demand. Um, we've seen bit by bit the likes of Netflix, Amazon and Apple start to dip their toes into the water here. Um, 
and you know, uh, Amazon, I'm sure many of you may have seen some of their coverage of the Premier League. They're, they're picking up rights in sports like tennis. They've just picked up international cricket in Australia, which is a big deal. Um, Apple is um, moving in wholesale on the, the Major League Soccer in the US. Reportedly had a huge impact on, on Lionel Messi going over to that league. And Netflix, which I suppose has been the most anti-sport, if we can say that, of, of the S-Word platforms, or certainly anti-live sport, has um, started to change its tune. So we've seen the WWE Raw deal, um, the, the, the upcoming Jake Paul uh, against Mike Tyson fight. I mean, whether or not these things are strictly speaking sport, I'll, I'll leave you to debate, but they're definitely live. Um, and I think, I, I was listening to a podcast on official partners the other day, and I think the phrase they use, I think is really important here, is that Netflix has, and, and, and the SVOD companies in general are inverting the sports media model. So what they've done is they've recognised this, this passion for storytelling among fans. I think they've recognised a bit of a shift in fandom, maybe away from teams and competitions and towards the centrality of the athlete as the creator, as the influencer, um, and building the stories around that. And then live isn't, isn't the cake with, with the documentaries and Nice Chair, it's the other way around. The, the, the storytelling is the cake and the live is, is the icing and cherry on top. And I think the way that that can be seen best is, is the, you know, the Netflix F1 series Drive to Survive, which is credited with delivering a 10% increase in fandom for uh, F1 in the US market, which is hugely important. But that has a consequence, um, that kind of fragmentation, both for brands that are trying to use sport as a driver of reach, but also for, con for, for the customers, for the fans themselves. So. Somebody worked out that if you were a, probably a younger NFL fan in the US, you didn't have any cable packages and you wanted to watch every single live uh, game in a season, you, you know, and subscribing to all of those different streaming platforms, you were looking at about a $1,600 outlay over the course of the year. For the Premier League, I think it works out at just shy of a thousand pounds if you wanted to watch every single game live and in, in the Premier League. The point is that, that people are very rarely going to actually spend that much money. They're going to pick and choose the platforms that best suit their, their needs, their preferences. And what that means is that ultimately um, brands are going to struggle to reach those targets that they've previously been able to enjoy when all sport was hoarded in one particular place. Um, this is Adrian Sutherland from Publicist Sports, who again talked to us for the report. And he says that brands are having to make choices effectively. They're having to pick and choose which platforms that they, they spend with, which media owners they, they, they direct their advertising dollars towards, which makes it harder to hit the kind of benchmarks, the KPIs that they're aiming for. This ultimately is, is driving the creation of a, of a new sports media market and one where live rights doesn't necessarily translate to um, a huge uptick in advertising spend. Um, we did some analysis, There's, this is a bit of a complicated chart, but we did some analysis of TV advertising spend in the UK during FIFA Men's World Cup years. Um, and what you can broadly see there um, is that in Q2, so the months leading up to World Cups, going back to Mexico 86, there was an average four percentage point uptick in advertising spend versus the rest of the year. What that translates as, brands are willing, were willing to spend incrementally in the build-up to big World Cups before the home nations crashed out ignominiously, usually. Um, Look at Italy in 1990, look at South Africa in, in 2010. But that effect is diminishing. So the last few competitions, you can see the effect has been, um, that, that connection has been weakening until you get to Qatar. And in fairness, the Qatar World Cup was in Q4. Um, it was right at the heart of the inflation cost of living crisis. So there were some factors influencing it. But fundamentally, that link between incremental ad spend on a channel like TV and, and sport is weakening. Um, brands are starting to look at alternatives potentially for, for, for how they drive reach. Um, only about a fifth of marketers said that sport is still really important to them. So it's something to consider, I think. How do rights holders respond? 
It's a huge question. We asked the IOC. Um, so this is Jérôme Parmentier. He, he runs all of the, the distribution rights deals um, for the Olympics. And he says they're absolutely focused still on, on that, reaching the widest possible audience being the number one goal. But I think an important point here is that, the, that the, the, it's probably the correct ambition for reach, but the aim of reach and the way that monetization works doesn't necessarily work in lockstep in a way that it used to. And that's probably mainly because of social media. So social media is where sports fandom takes place. It's where you follow your favorite athletes. It's where you see clips and highlights and, and even some sort of, you know, things like AR tools and, and more entertainment around competitions. There's a huge increase in the amount of sports content being viewed on social media. Um, that you know, could be live clips, but also behind the scenes footage. Um, we spoke to TikTok and Snapchat for this report, and they are you know, really investing in making sure that they build this, this sports area. They see it as a huge growth space for them. But of course, those social media platforms, as much as money as they, they have, they're not at the moment looking to get into sport as a streamer. Um, there were some rumors about Facebook maybe five or six years ago, but at the moment they don't need to. We, we've got a report coming up on social media really soon and the social media platforms don't need to spend billions on live rights at the moment because they're doing just okay without it. So this means that I think um, as a rights owner, it's about figuring out how to use things like platforms like social to get younger fans in particular to watch the live footage in whatever streamer or broadcaster is in that particular market. Um, I'm nearly out of time, so let's just recap those, those three main points. Um, live sports still really, really matters. Um, it still drives huge live audiences and, uh, and has massive cultural impact. But that impact is being slightly affected by the fragmentation of the way people are consuming media, the way that rights are being distributed um, across devices, platforms, situations. And I think that what it means is that that, that three-pronged relationship between advertisers, between media owners and between rights holders is changing and it's evolving. Um, and for media owners to continue to attract brands with sports content, with rights holders to be able to monetize their sport. Um, they need to find, there's gonna be new relationships that need to be built um, and new ways of cultivating and engaging sports fans. Um, that's everything from me. Thank you very much for listening. Um, if you want to download the report, please scan that QR code. There's a uh, sample version um, available. Um, but otherwise, thank you. <laughs>